Amen. Amen. But thank goodness for Jesus. Amen. That's right. Amen. Thank goodness for Jesus. Amen. Philippians chapter 3 this morning, we'll look at verses 1 through 9. I will not have the time to, I will not take the time, even though I've been given it, uh, I will not take the time to be able to preach each of these verses uh, as they deserve, but that's not my goal. I have a goal today to reinforce the simple gospel. In fact, that is my message, the simple gospel. We make it complicated. We make it difficult. We make it hard. But God, knowing the human race, made salvation and sanctification simple. The problem is we ball it up. We mess it up. We make it complicated. And uh, out of all the things that the Apostle Paul had to do relative to the introduction of the new covenant to humanity, that was he had to... Uh, he had to take a look at what people thought and where people came from and deal with those issues and bring us back to the simplicity that is in Christ. And I almost forgot. Uh, we have some material on the back table from the ministry, expositor study Bibles for 40, crossfire for 25, CDs for 10 or 3 for 25, and books, uh, $15 a piece, 2 for 25. There may be something there that would bless you, that would help you. That's why we brought the material. Pick it up. Someone will be there at the table to help you after service. But let's read our text today, Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous. But for you, it is safe. If you have a preacher that preaches... The same things again and again and again. Please don't get bored with him or her. It's safe for you. We don't always get it the first time. We never get it the first time. Amen. Verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. We'll explain those briefly as we go through the text today. They're not easy to grasp at first view. Verse 3. For we are the circumcision. And this is a good term. This is the people that are right with God. And this is the attributes that we find in people today, Christians that are right with God. Watch. We are the circumcision, number one, which worship God in the Spirit. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. And we have no confidence in the flesh. Let me read those three things again. We are the circumcision, the people that are right with God. Because we worship God in the spirit. We worship him in spirit and in truth. We'll talk about that. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. Does his name still make you happy? Does it still cause joy to rise up in your heart? Then you're on the right track. And thirdly, we have no confidence in the flesh. Flesh simply means me. And the things that I have, the things that I can do, the uh, arrangements of ritual that I create and walk in, the fellowships that I have. I don't have any confidence in anything that men can do. Paul then says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh... I more. Paul says, hey, there's a lot of reasons why I could point to what I have done and what I belong to if that's what it was really all about. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee. Paul used to think that these items were the base of his walk with God. He used to think that this that he belonged to and this that he did established him with God and pleased God. He goes on, verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. People that think they're keeping the law don't have it quite right up here. Because none of us have been able to maintain the proper attitude we might be able to keep the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law and the advanced standing of where the law was meant to take humanity, <laughs> sorry, it doesn't work for any of us. That's right. But Paul said back then, I thought I was blameless. Now watch verse 7. 
But what things were gain to me? The idea is he thought those things placed himself or those actions that he did or the things that he belonged to. He thought that they placed them in a credit side of his spiritual ledger. Uh, I know that especially the young people these days, balancing the checkbook is not something they do. They just look at what they have left in the account. Big mistake. I know I've raised four children, and they've tried to balance their checkbook just by looking at the amount on their phone of what they have left in the bank. You can't do that because you always forget the one that hasn't come through yet. So all of a sudden as you run through Starbucks to get your special coffee for six bucks, you overdrew your account by a dollar thirty-eight and they charge you thirty-five bucks. Amen. And you look at that, so when you look at a ledger, you need to know what's in it. And Paul said, I used to think that my spiritual letter, our ledger, my what was a credit, was coming from all these things that I did and that I belonged to. I thought that that was building up a religious amount in the credit side of my spiritual ledger. But I've come to understand that those things... I've had to count loss for Christ mm -hmm. because those things were in reality not raising my spiritual ledger. They were a detriment. They were a loss. They were subtracting. See, a lot of the things we do in Christendom, when we don't understand how the gospel works, the things we think God stacks up so highly and gives us credit in our spiritual accounts for, they're actually stealing from our spiritual ledger. Paul, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. We've got to come to the place that nothing is more important than just getting to know Jesus. Amen. It's that simple, getting to know Christ and letting Him guide me. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb. Dumb isn't a pretty word, and dumb simply in the Greek means dumb. <laughs> if I if I have to explain that to you, well, um, I'm not gonna get a dictionary and look it up. And if you can even Google it on your phone, you'll find that dumb means dumb. So Paul looked at all those things and he threw them in the dung pile, in the refuse pile, in the waste pile, in the rubbish pile. So that, verse 9, that he could be found in him, not having, read these words, not having my own righteousness. I do not stand in the righteousness of Warren Larson. This gospel that we preach is not a show. It's an understanding that Jesus and Jesus alone as a result of my simple faith in Him, has given me His righteousness. Amen. If I think that God accepts me because of what I do, I'm operating in my righteousness. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy as a believer to slip over into trusting in what we do. And the more we do of that, the less we do of trusting in Him. That's right. doesn't mean we don't have to live right doesn't mean that we don't have to act right. It doesn't mean that we don't need to increase our knowledge and our reception of grace and all those things that are important. But it's vital that you don't start thinking so well of yourself that you don't need Jesus anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to be found in Him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I want to minister to you this morning the simple gospel. Yes, yes. The simple gospel. Let's pray. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of yes. God. We thank you for the men that wrote it and the inspiration that brought it to us. And the safe hand of your own person that has guided it into our heads and our hearts this morning. Thank you for preserving your word that we might study it. Now, Lord, as we teach it, as we preach it, as we proclaim it to the people, I ask, dear Lord, that you would anoint me with the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, 
And Father, that these here that have ears to hear would receive those things that are particular to them, peculiar to their life, that the needs of their lives might be met and encouraged. And those things that needed to be eliminated, eliminated. And we'll give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. And amen. The simple gospel. If uh, there was ever something that had to be simple, that was simple, it has to be the gospel. We preach the gospel. We talk about the gospel. Well, then what is the gospel? Yes. What is it? And we talk, it's the gospel. It's the gospel. Well, uh, the quick answer is it's good news. It is good news. That's what gospel means. Literally, good news. But what's the good news? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Have you ever thought about it? Has anybody ever asked you to define the gospel? What is the good news that we preach? What is the good news that we have to accept? Well, it's all about two things. The gospel really has two branches on the gospel tree, if you will. And that's, first of all, it's all about the person of Jesus. It's all about Christ. It's not about Crossway Ministry. It's not about Family Worship Center. It's not about SBN. It's not about the Expositor Study Bible. It's not about your favorite Bible. It's not about your church. It's all about one man. Amen. It's all about the man, Jesus Christ. And he, that lest we go ahead. Amen. The man, Jesus Christ, was the Son of God. He existed in heaven for all eternity. Before uh, he came here, he was with the Father in glory and uh, lived in a, in a light that we can't even comprehend. He was with him from the beginning, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is not just a prophet. He's not just a good man. He is God. Amen. But he chose as a member of the triune Godhead to be the one that would leave heaven, be born of a virgin, that'll blow you away, and come into this world, live perfectly and sinlessly for 33 and a half years, and at the end of his sojourn, here on the planet, he said, I qualify because I've never sinned as a sacrifice for sin for all men yes. for all time. So the man, Christ Jesus, went to the other side of the gospel branch. He went to the cross. So the other side that we have to learn about is him crucified. So the gospel is the person of Christ, understanding who he is, where he came from. This is a study that the gospels give us, that the old covenant gives us. There must be 300 to 350 different, uh, uh, actually, actions or prophecies or situations that pertain to the Messiah that Jesus fulfilled when he came. Right. 300, 350 that said, this is where he was going to be born. This is what he was going to do. This is what would happen when he would preach. This is what was going to happen when he died. The, the Old Testament even tells us that he was going to rise again. So it's all about his person. But listen, if you ever leave off the redemptive act of what he came to do, you don't have redemption. Right. You have a Messiah, but you don't have a Savior. You might have a Lord, but you don't have a Redeemer. You might have the most important person on the planet, but you don't have the action that provides you to have a relationship with God. Yeah. So we learn about Jesus, who he is, and we learn about what he did to redeem fallen man Back to God. This is the good news that we get to share. This is the good news that we get to preach. And our part in that is not to be him. And our part in that is not to die on the cross of Calvary. Our role in the good news is to simply believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who accept him, diligently seek him. And when we simply by faith accept who he is and what he has done, then God open up, opens up the bank of heaven Hallelujah. and says everything that you will ever need for life and for all things for yes. eternity, I now yeah. can yes. give to you not because you deserve it, not right. because you earn it, not because you are good enough to receive it, but because you humbled yourself yes. and by yes. faith you said yes to All Jesus. Right. You didn't know. Hallelujah. You didn't know. You didn't know all about 
Jesus and all about what he did on the day you got saved. But somehow, somebody was preaching the good news or you were reading the good news or you were hearing a song sung about the good news, the gospel, Jesus, and what he did for us. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit swept in and interrupted your world and showed you that you were a sinner, separated yeah. from God, hopeless yeah. and helpless with no recourse of coming to God except that you would reach out by faith and grasp a hold of a down-reaching, nail-scarred hand. And the minute you did that, God said, Say! That's the good news. I said, that's the good news. Salvation by faith. And then the Bible says in three different locations, here's the good news. The just yes. shall live by faith. He didn't say the just shall get saved by faith because if you're a just person, you're already saved. Yes. Because the only way to be justified is for you to accept the simple gospel, that which Jesus did, and place your faith in him. And listen, this is beautiful. I, don't, I didn't come to teach on justification, but how can I talk about the good news without talking about yes. justification? Justification is God's legal declaration of your status with him when you accept Christ. When you say yes to Jesus, God looks at you and says you are justified just as if you have never sinned. I don't see any iniquity in Jacob. I don't see any perverseness in Israel. I see them as spotless and clean and righteous. And that's why Paul says in our text that I don't want to have righteousness that comes based on what I do. I want to come to the righteousness that only comes to me from God by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Woo! That's Amen. good news. Amen. And there's nobody that can't have it because there's nobody that Jesus did not, there's a lot of negatives there, did not die for. Jesus died for all men. When he died on Calvary, he paid every sin of all men, all women, all boys, all girls that have ever lived, lived have ever breathed, have ever thought, have ever walked upon the earth. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And three days later, he got up from the tomb, proving that his sacrifice was greater than sin, because if sin was still prevalent, and sin could have held him in the grave, it would have. But his sacrifice was so complete, it was so awesome, it did everything we would ever need. And in doing so, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. And now he's alive forevermore. And I've got somebody to shout yes about the Thank you, Jesus. So Christianity is not a show. Thank you, Lord. It's not a billboard on the side of the street. God miracles. Right. Right. That's true. Yes. It's the answer to man's sin yes. dilemma. Hallelujah. Yes. Sin is what ruins our lives. Sin yes. is what destroys us. Sin is what brings death. Sin is what brings sickness. Sin, the results of the fall. And we're neck deep in it. <laughs> but good news. Yes. Good news. Hallelujah. I came to say good news. Yes. This morning. Yes. Jesus Christ, who he is, the Messiah, yes. and what he did, the Redeemer can set you free Amen. and give you a life with God and make your heart glad. It won't eliminate all the problems of our lives. Jim, you're going to say, you're going to listen, you're, you, let me just be plain. You're going to encounter a whole new set of problems when you get saved. Right, right. Excuse me. Amen! Yeah. You're, you're going to encounter a whole new set of warfare issues. And they, they pale in comparison in their intensity and in the reality and in the outcome. And if we fail in this spiritual battle that we're in because we don't comprehend, we don't embrace, we don't 
love, we don't pursue the simple gospel, then we won't have the benefits of it. And all that Jesus died to provide will little by little be taken away wow. from us. So we need to hold to the simple gospel. Yes. The one that God gave us. Amen. And to that end, Paul lived, breathed, and died to bring to light to those who were saved the truth of the gospel. Now, Paul was a man who was educated in the law. And understand this, that the early church, um, its Bible was probably the Septuagint, the uh, Greek rendition of the Hebrew Scriptures. But it was all Old Covenant. We have the letters today. We have the New Testament. But everything that Paul taught and preached came out of the Old Covenant because that's all that they had. So Paul was the one to properly interpret the Old Covenant and tell us what God intended. Yeah. God chose him. He wasn't better than John. He wasn't better than Peter. He wasn't better than uh, the other nine disciples that survived after the crucifixion. John gave us a revelation that Paul never had. Right. Read the last book of the New Testament. Why? Because that was John's job. And Paul was not better, but he was qualified and equipped by God even before he was saved to be that man yes. in a position to know and understand the Old Covenant and to bring us the understanding. So when we talk about Paul being the author of the New Covenant, he was just simply the perfect choice. He wasn't better. He didn't do anything better than Peter. He didn't do anything better than... He just was the man that God chose that had all the qualifications. Each one of you have a separate qualifications. You have qualities. You have talents. You've got something on the inside of you that God has placed in you for a specific purpose for such a time as this. And he wants that time and that talent to be given to the Lord and let him use you for that. And you're a unique individual. No one else can do what you have been destined to do in Christ. Right. Amen. Oh, Brother Larson, now you're trying to sell me ministry. No, I'm talking about cleaning the toilets, <laughs> mowing the grass, running the sound, cleaning the sanctuary. Amen. Amen. What's that? I'm just yeah. preaching better than your amen. Yeah. <laughs> Because when we work together, everybody has a function. That's right. That's right. Amen. And there's nothing too low and nothing too high. So Paul was just the man that God chose to bring us the new covenant. And so he goes about trying to uncover, unveil the mystery that has been veiled in God, in Christ, since before the cross. The early disciples, the first ten years of the church, they didn't know that. And one of the things that began to surface in the early church was how do we deal with the law? What's our relationship to the Mosaic law? And Paul dealt with that. And I don't have really a lot of time to deal with that this morning, but he, he says this in his text. He says, finally, my brethren, just like a preacher, <laughs> starts the third chapter, says, finally, he's still got two more to write. <laughs> Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Can I can I just take a sideline here, a little rabbit trail? There's no reason in the world that you as a Christian should lose your praise. That's right. In fact, your praise oftentimes is the thing that will dispel the darkness. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lift up your voice to God. Pray in the spirit. And with understanding, oh, magnify the Lord. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lift up your voice to God. You can pray in the spirit and with understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. When you're going through a trial and your heart is broken, just turn your face to the wall and say, Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I give you praise. I give you praise. Because despite what I feel, despite what I'm going through, despite the crushing that I sense, I still believe in you. And so I will give you praise for the good news. And Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again I say rejoice. 
He said, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous. The Pauline epistles would repeat themselves over and over and over again because we need to hear the principles of the simple gospel. He said it is safe. And now in verse 2, he deals with those people that wanted to, and really there were a variety of errors in the church, but they wanted us to not be simple. They wanted us to live by law. They want us to go back to the Mosaic Law. I don't know what they were thinking. 613 specific laws that God gave us in the Torah, in the, those first five books of the Bible. And today, you can't keep most of them because they were originally made with Israel and could only be accomplished by people who had a temple or a tabernacle who lived in the Middle East and yet we still have people that want to live by law. Well, i got to keep the Sabbath. Oh, I can't eat this, and I can't do that, and I can't. See, you're leaving the simple gospel. Yeah. And Paul got a little rife, a little ripe. He says, beware of dogs. See, it was really commonplace for the Jew to look at a Gentile. And said, you're a dog. You're a pariah dog. You know all those dogs that hangs out at the junkyard? You can see their bones and, and they don't belong to anybody. You get close and Arr. that's what the Gentiles looked at. Uh, they were called that by the Jew. But now the people that are trying to get the Christian to leave the simple gospel, Paul turns that phrase on them. He said, beware. And he said it three times, beware. Beware. Look, 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 listen, comprehend. Can I say it to you? Beware. Three times. It's emphasized. You need to watch out for what's being preached. Beware of somebody, I'm going to say it nicely, that's going to take you away from the simple gospel. Beware of dogs. Beware. Beware of evil workers. He called these people that tried to change the gospel evil workers. He has already called them uh, previously in 2 Corinthians 11 deceitful workers. Uh, so beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. And here he gets really kind of mm. borderline. He says beware of the concision. Mm. Because one of the things that those that wanted to go back to the law tried to preach was circumcision. That's right. Now, the problem with that is that just like any crazy thing that goes outside of the simple gospel, if circumcision is required for salvation or even required to live right for God, what do women do? I'm not going to be crude and I'm not really going to explain it to you. But that would leave women out. If circumcision is required for salvation, if you don't know what it is, Google it when you leave, then how, how are women to be saved? Is women's salvation only to be tied to a man who's circumcised? That would make it a family redemption, not an individual right. redemption. Right. Right. Good. Christianity is a not a family yeah. religion. It's right. not a right. church religion. You're not saved because yes. you go to church. You're not saved because you're in a family that's Christian. You're saved because you see yourself as a Hallelujah. sinner and accept Jesus yeah. as the only sinner. So circumcision is a thing they tried to push on the people. And Paul says, beware. Mm -hmm. Of the concision. Now, the only time this word is used, it talks about a eunuch. Okay, I'm going to get embarrassed here. Eunuch. Uh, somebody who lost the capacity to reproduce because something wasn't just circumcised. Something was cut off. That's right. That's right. So Paul uses that difficult term. Some of the kids are looking at me like, okay, ask your mom. Ask your dad. Concision. See, it's a cut. It's a cut. Yeah, it's a cut. It's a wrong word. It's a it's a it's an attack against those because he literally is said, calls them mutilators because it describes a word of the old priests that were um, priests not of God but priests of pagan temples. They would mutilate themselves. Beware of the mutilators. See what Paul is saying there. That's not allowed. The beware of the dogs. Beware of, of, of evil workers. Beware of the condescension. This is Paul's attitude towards somebody that wants to change the simple gospel. And then he uses a term that the Jew always liked to 
put up against the Gentile. He says, for we are the circumcision. Yes. What does that mean? Well, the, the, the term circumcision was granted to the Jew because they were God's special people. And they were. They still are. God's going to do some things with the Jew and the yes, per and the, yes. and, well let me just say it this way God raised up the Jewish nation to be the head of all the earth and head of the families of all the earth and they are going to be in the future the head of all the families of the earth because the plan of God cannot be denied and God is going to have to bring them through to faith in the simple gospel yes. and bring them into relationship with God that's eschatology ask pastor about it in the future so the whole process process is he's going to do that but they the Jew began to be separate they became uh, sectarian they became separate from all the families around them and they would say we are the circumcision and they meant that we're the only people on the planet that are right with God can I just wave the white flag of caution to you if you think that you're the only church that preaches the gospel in this area right right if you think that family worship center Nestian is the only one that preaches the God, maybe you better take a close look because there's a lot of people preaching faith in Christ. Amen. Now, you might be the only one preaching the simple gospel. Come on. But that doesn't mean that people outside of this church aren't saved. Come on. If anybody who places faith in Jesus, I'm sorry yeah. uh, if it doesn't meet your qualification. It doesn't really matter what you think. It only matters what God sees. And if a heart has reached out by faith to Jesus, then Jesus has become Lord of their life. Now, if they don't understand the cross, they don't understand the simple gospel, then that relationship with Christ is greatly hindered. Yeah. Yes and amen. But we don't look at brothers and sisters as enemies, right. even though Right. They may not like it when you tell them you're not actually embracing the simple gospel, but you're all still in the same family. So think of it as Thanksgiving or Christmas. Yeah. 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 Excuse me a minute. Yeah. Still family. Yes, amen. And I'm praying that the whole family gets the simple gospel. Hallelujah. But if you run across a dog, if you run across an evil worker, if you run across someone that demands concision, don't go. For we are the true people of God. Here's three attributes that should be with us. Which worship God in the Spirit. There was a day when Jesus, while he walked in the earth in his earthly ministry, he walked where no other Jew would walk, and that was into Samaritan. Samaria. Samaria was the place where the half breeds I can't do. No, <laughs> no, quote, quote. Where the half breeds live, right? When I get mad, I get out on the freeway and hitchhike. <laughs> Just makes everybody upset. They don't know which way I want to go. <laughs> yeah. I want to play piano, but I'll never do an all-state commercial. You know, they just want to do But, right, you get it. Okay. So the whole process of living for Christ has to be that we understand the simple gospel. Jesus goes into Samaria, and the half-breeds live there. So the Jewish people would actually go three days out of their way just so they didn't have to go th through Samaria. Wow. Buddy, that's religion. Yeah. Right, right. Go three days out of your way just so you don't have to <laughs> see somebody that in reality is no worse or better than you are. Amen. Come on. Amen. But you Amen. think that. Anyway, so Jesus just marches right up into Samaria. You know the story. He meets the woman at the well, and he tells her, you know, there's coming an hour, there's coming a day when the argument about where you worship. That's right. Really, really won't matter because God is looking for people to worship Him in spirit, yes. from the heart, and in truth, in light of the simple gospel. Yes. In spirit, from the heart, and in truth, in what the Bible tells us is the simple gospel. So if you're here this morning just rejoicing in Christ Jesus because you're saved and you're dependent upon Him, then you are the circumcision who is 
rejoicing and loving Jesus. You're worshiping God from the heart. Woo! That's good. You're the ones that Jesus prophesied on that day in John chapter 4 to the Samaritan woman. They're going to worship me in spirit and in truth. It won't be about what they belong to, where they're from. Secondly, they'll rejoice in Christ Jesus. He's the focus. We've already talked about that. But here comes the big one. We have no confidence in the flesh. Yes. Now, flesh is a far, far <laughs> larger topic than I can cover in the next 10 minutes. I'm not going to try it. But flesh, in, in, in simplistic terms, is just what created man now is. We live in flesh. And it has been tainted by the fall. Uh, flesh includes everything that pertains to man. The mind, the heart, soul, the spirit. It's all been <coughs> corrupted by the fall. Now, if you're a born-again believer, God has recreated your soul and recreated your spirit and recreate and your mind is being renewed, but you still operate in flesh. And every now and then Amen. every other thought. Every now and then <laughs> the evidence that you're not quite as holy as you like to think. You right. 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 Pop, you know, that thought yes, sir. pops yes. into the brain or that desire <coughs> pops into the body or there's something you don't understand or an old word you haven't used for a long time gets resurrected. <laughs> 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 or emotion, you know, that you used to, but now you don't. All of a sudden it sneaks out of the covering of Christ and poof. And so Paul would say, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Yes. The flesh, and here's why I bring it up, will always oppose the cross. That's right. Amen. Because flesh dies on the cross. Oh, that's good. Flesh has to succumb to the cross. So... Flesh moves us towards self and what we do. And that, this right. is the little song that I made up last night and have done it for years. That me, 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 me thing. Right, right. It, it's all about me. Come on. Me. Not you. Me. Me. That's flesh. And, and, and I'm afraid that so much of what we do in church today is instigated by the flesh. We right. are, man, we want to be seen. We want to be heard. I don't want to clean the toilets. I don't want to mop the floor. I don't want to do anything unless people see me. That's flesh yeah, trying to aggrandize, lift up itself. Yeah. And religion hides itself, but yet clothes itself in flesh mm. because we become proud and arrogant. Right. Right. Uh, we, we, and I've seen this. We've been preaching the message of the cross from Brother Swagger's uh, radio station since 1996-97. And one of the things that I've seen that I do not like, and that we must not go right. here, Pastor, we must not, and that is that we get the big head about what we know, right. that we're right. better than that person Amen. over there. Amen. You might have knowledge that other people don't have, but don't let knowledge Puff you yeah. up. Okay. That's evidence that you're operating in flesh. You're now taking a truth of God and making you look good and other people look bad. That's not why God gave you truth. God gave you truth so that you could repent of anything that wasn't truth and so that you could learn how to grow in grace and the knowledge of God. And that should make you even more... Uh, apt to share yeah. the simple gospel with someone else. But every now and then I see those fleshly attributes come up where, well, we're just the only ones and nobody else is living for God. And nobody. <laughs> I'm going to blow you away. There's some Roman Catholics in this town that really are saved. Yes. Amen. Amen. I don't think they're growing very well because of where they're right. at. <laughs> Right. And if you listen to wrong doctrine, it'll stifle your growth and maybe even destroy the faith. But the, the simple gospel comes back to, do you believe that Jesus... Now, okay, 
don't leave this morning and say, oh, Ruben Larson said we should just become Roman Catholic. That's not what he said. <laughs> it's already on Facebook, I know. Go to Facebook. Thank you for correcting Yeah. So we have to be careful, and what I've seen at times is pride and arrogance become prominent, and a message is supposed to break that down. It's yeah. not about us. Amen. It's about Him. Amen. And it's about His plan. Oh, and it's about what He has done. Oh, so I rejoice when I experience the reality. So many people who learn the simple gospel say, man, I had that when I first got saved and yeah. somehow yeah. I lost it. You did because flesh and religion came mm. in wow. and covered up the truth and smothered the wow. benefit yeah, of yeah. simple faith in Christ. Yeah. And before you knew it, you were the only one that really lived for God. Right, right, right. Everybody else, if they were, if they would just do what I do, if they just wow. think like I thought, if they wow. dressed like I dressed, and did what I did, and they had the same convictions that I did, then they would be as good as Jesus and me. Wow. <laughs> and I make fun of it, but yet we go there. Oh, yeah. And we go there because we live in flesh. Yeah. And flesh will be a part of this battle until the day the trump sounds and corruption yes. puts on incorruption. So you must be aware of it. You don't have to be scared of it because the simple gospel can defeat the fleshly inclinations right. that we have. Amen. Galatians 5 and 24 says, They that are crucified, I have crucified the flesh yes. with its affections and lusts. So what does that mean? It means that the capacity to rise above fleshly inclination and fleshly movements going the wrong way, if you'll identify them, if you'll see them, you can go, Oh, help, grace, help, yes. Jesus! Yes. Yeah, you want to know the, the best theological prayer you can ever pray? I'm going to give it to you in one word. Help! Yes. Yes. Amen. 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 You might want to add Jesus to it. Help, Jesus! Yes. Now you're all right. Get up in the morning and say, Help, Jesus! Yes. Go through your day and stop praying. Help, Jesus! Yes. It would probably be better than some of the other stuff we offer up. Right. But it, it, I'm not, I'm just, you need to understand the aid that you've got to have every single day in this life. Yes. Because you live in a fleshly encasement that has been corrupted by the fall, and you ain't as good as you think you are. That's right. And if there's any good in us, it's because God has had yes, His right. way. And that's grace right. and faith has worked us and conformed us into the image of Christ. We are not to have any confidence yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. in the flesh. You need to know who you are. Now, balance that with understanding that we don't go beating ourselves up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Early church fathers literally did that. They wow. would take a cat of nine tails and mm -hmm. flagellate their backs, thinking that that would get lust out of their system. Wow. It got some blood out of their system, but they were bloody lusters when it was all right. 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 And we laugh about it, but we do the same oh, yeah. silly thing. We yes. might not take a cat of nine tails, but we take religious practices right, and we right. try to overcome these bents in us that are ungodly by means of the flesh. Yeah. And Paul said, if anybody could have counted on the flesh, it was me. Mm. Wow. I was circumcised the eighth day. Man, I was born into this thing. Uh, and circumcision today is like water baptism. Again, circumcision was a covenant sign. Water baptism is a covenant sign. Some people have said that water baptism is required for salvation. It isn't. It's evidence of salvation. Amen. So there's a fleshly endeavor. He says, I'm of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. When Judah... Uh, uh, in the south was the only tribe that stayed true to the Lord and the other ten tribes followed Jeroboam into the golden calf worship it was Benjamin yeah. that stayed true to Judah so I'm part of Benjamin <laughs> not only was he part of Benjamin but he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews his parents even though they didn't live in Jerusalem they lived in Tarsus maintained their Hebraic roots they maintained everything there was to, and at that day they should have I'm not making fun of it he says, it's touching the law. I was a Pharisee. I was of the strictest 
sect, S-E-C-T, of the, of the law. The Pharisees, there were probably at the time of Christ uh, only about 5,000 of them. They were that strict. They had, but the people, ever, everybody looked at them and going, oh, whoo, there's a man of God. Yeah. You know, I mean, and they were... And they were silly. They were ridiculous. They yeah. had one group they called the bloody Pharisees. And this was, this was embarrassingly stupid. Uh, whenever they saw a woman that caused them to lust, they would take a, a, a visor and throw it over their head. Well, why did they call them bloody? Because they kept walking until they walked into something and would get a bruise in their head would bleed. And then when their face was covered and their head was bleeding, then they were saying, I am really holy. Wow. Well, ma'am, how would you feel if they walked by you and the visor didn't come up? <laughs> okay, I hate to be real in church, but what would that say to you? See, so they're, they're actually acknowledging that they're overwhelmed with lust when the visor comes up. And they're taking pride in the fact that, well, when I lust, I beat my brain in. <laughs> That's religion. Yeah. Yeah. And Paul said, hey, if anybody could, I was a part of the Pharisees. Now, maybe he wasn't the bleeding Pharisee, but concerning zeal, per per persecuting the church, man, if you didn't act like I did, I was going to, he, he saw people killed. He put people in jail. Right. Right. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You could not charge me. And I'll just say this about the law. The law, the Mosaic law, was God talking to elementary children. He was revealing himself for the first time to humanity, but they couldn't handle much. So he said, don't do this, because that's all I can handle. If you're raising a two-year-old and you live in an area where there's a busy street out front or around your house, you take that two-year-old over to the front yard right next to the road and you say this, you say, do not mm -mm, at any time even think about going into the road. Do not, now you don't explain to the kid why. You just put the fear of God in him and say, yeah. Law says thou shalt not. Don't ever put, if I see one foot in that road, I'm going to beat you with an inch of your life. <laughs> and the kid, you know, might listen and he might not. But the law to that elementary mind made sense. Yeah. But when he becomes 10 or maybe 8, or six if you are got a good kid, you take him to the edge of the road and you say, if the ball you're playing with rolls out into the road, whatever you do, make sure that you look to the left and to the right and don't just run out into the road because if you run out into the road, you're going to get killed. Yeah. You're going to get hit by a car. It's going to be a bad boat boat, so don't do that. See, when you're older, when you're more mature, when you go beyond the elementary things, you can explain why. You can release the law, good, and you can yeah. explain, this is why I don't want you running out in the road because you'll get hurt by a car. You can't, you don't try to say that to a two-year-old. You just say, don't. And when God gave the law, he was speaking to spiritually minded two-year-olds, thou shalt not. But when Jesus came, he said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, you can't even dislike somebody. Right. Man. See, now we're teenagers going, I mean, is there anybody in church here you don't like that brown? <laughs> ah, see, it used to be don't kill. But now if there's an improper emotion towards somebody, you know, Sister Big Hair sits in front of you every Sunday, Big Hair, beehive, all the way up to the roof. And she bounces around from night of this worship until the bobby pins fly into your eyes and you can't even see the screen. And it doesn't matter where you stand, Sister Big Hair just comes in front of you and says, hey, what are you doing? 
and starts to worship, and I can't see anything. I wish the earth would swallow up and take away Sister Big Hair. And even when she fell into the pit, I'd have to hit her hair down. Because I don't like Sister Big Hair. Whoa, wait a minute. See, the simple gospel yes. right, right. says we need to take care of that. Yes. I know I don't have time to do it, but if you would study the 16 aspects of what love is. Aww. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8a. Pastor, it would be a great study. 16 aspects of love. One of them is you believe that that other person wants to live for Jesus. You don't wow, doubt that they have good intentions. You don't misread you their Right. Intent. You believe that they want to do the right thing. You believe that they are seeking after God just like you are. You don't think any wrong about them. You don't believe any wrong about them. That's, That's good. good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'll come back next week, teach this. You know, you need to understand that that's, that's not, thou shalt not kill. That's the advancement of maturity in the gospel. Not just I won't kill, but I can't even dislike because that's the spirit of hate. And hate is the spirit of murder. So why would I want to go back to thou shalt not kill when the simple gospel will bring me to grace that can supply me with love for people I don't even Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 Excuse me. Amen. I get it. But do you get it? See, to take you out of the simple gospel is to take you out of the maturity that you could find in Christ. Amen. Yes. It's to rob you of the access to grace that can cause you to love the unlovable to have faith for that one you think will never grow up in your local church and all of a sudden you find yourself praying for them harder than your own begins. Amen. Because the grace of God in the simple gospel begins to mold you and shape you in love for people and love for God and love. Now what we're doing, we're doing out of love. We're not doing it out of law and I have to because God doesn't love me if I don't do this. I know I'm loved. I know I'm accepted. And I want to take this love and acceptance that God is birthing in me and give it to every member of my church. Watch. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples by the sign on the door. Amen. By whether or not you preach the cross, right. whether or not you call yourself the crossway ministry, whether or not you're associated with this group or that group, by the way that you love one another. When you learn the grace of God and you transcend law, which Paul gives us here, and you embrace what God can do in your heart and do in your life, then you start loving people in the world around you in Patterson and is it Berwick, Morgan City? They go, whoa, mm -hmm. they must really have something over there. They must really, man, they, they, didn't, they didn't judge me. They didn't tell me I could live in sin either, but they let me come in and let me be a part and I saw how they interacted with one another, not how they gossiped about each other, not how they talked each other down and hated each other and belittled each other and went to lunch after Sunday morning and had fried preacher in there. <laughs> Did you hear what he said today? <laughs> My goodness. So this love that we have for people is birthed in us when we embrace the simple gospel. we got to hurry now. I'm boring you. But what things were gained to me? See, fleshly endeavor looked good. It sounded good. But as I said before, it wasn't raising your spiritual ledger. It was lowering it. Yes, yes. What are you doing right now this morning in Christendom that isn't working? 
It's not producing godly love towards other people. It's not producing a change in the way you think. You're still struggling with, you fill in the blank, anger. How about malice? Wanting to see something bad happen to somebody else. Rejoicing when another believer fails publicly. We need to fix that. And only the simple gospel Amen. can fix that. And then our spiritual ledgers, because we're encountering faith and grace, is going to help us. And But you and I have to be counting everything but loss. Except for the knowledge of Him, who He is, and what He did. That's the message of the cross. That's the gospel. That's the simple gospel. You dedicate yourself to understanding Jesus and understanding what He did and what it can do in you. And you experience it for yourself. And when you do, you're going to extend that to the people around you. And because we're in this flesh, it's not easy. Yeah. Great opposition, great war will come. But I tell you this, that your faith in Jesus will always cause you to have the victory. Hallelujah. 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 Even when the saints don't have the victory. That's right. Yeah. You yes. can get the victory. Amen. 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 And that's what I want for you. But you're going to have to embrace the simple gospel. I'll close with this. Naya, come. You place your faith in who Jesus is. And you look to Him for every need. Amen. This is the mature believer now saying, I can't, but you can help. Yeah. Lord, I look to You. Not only will you be receiving the righteousness of God, as a result of your simple faith, you can know that your heart is right. You can know that the grace of God will transform you into the image of Christ. And you won't do it perfectly. We may never do this perfectly, even up to the sound of the trump. But I want a percentage of my life to be far closer to this. So I place my faith in Him who He is, what He's done. And I let the grace of God flow. I let Him move in me. The grace of God is the power of the Holy Spirit so I might be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the fleshly endeavors of the law, but that I might in fact have that righteousness which comes not just justification by faith, but sanctification by faith. Transformers transforming me by faith. I want the righteousness that's imputed, but I also want righteous action in reality. It doesn't come through law. It doesn't come through any fleshly endeavor. That righteous reaction that you're looking for, that you haven't discovered yet, will only happen when your faith is here in Christ, who He is and what He's done. And you sell out to that. You give it to that. Every evaluation of yourself, everything that you look at, every way you, you look at that only. And you say, Jesus, I'm not where I need to be. Help me. And thank you. Because you brought me a mighty long way. You brought me a mighty long way. From the drug addiction and the alcoholism. From the pornography and the quaaludes. From the cocaine into religious practice separating me from law. You brought me a mighty long way yeah. Jesus. You want to take me a lot further. Yeah. And I want that for you, but I know this. It only comes when you understand and embrace the simple gospel. Hallelujah. The simple gospel. Faith in Christ and what He did. Would you stand with me this morning? Yeah. This is Sunday morning and I apologize for going later than you probably are used to. I don't know that, but I do want to say thank you for coming this morning, but I have this. I need to give this to you. If you have to leave, I understand, but if you would stick with me for just a minute. If you're here this morning, you've wandered into the ministry here, or maybe you've been coming for a while, 
But as we've talked about the simple gospel, you realize you're not saved. Your faith is in everything except what Jesus did. You might have been in church all your life. But that has no benefit if your heart hasn't been released to Jesus. If you're here this morning and you would say, Brother Larson, as you talked, the Holy Spirit has been touching my heart and I, I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm not right. I'm not where I need to be and I want a new start. I want a fresh start this morning. I wouldn't embarrass you and I trust that this church will love you and encourage you. But if that's you this morning, would you just lift that hand and say, Brother Larson, pray for me. Yes. Over here, the hand, I see it. Another? Someone yes. else, I see that hand. Is there another? Just say, pray for me. I want to make my salvation secure. Yes. I want to be sure that I'm trusting in Him. I want a fresh start this morning. I'm going to ask you to pray with me because what we're about to encounter is the greatest miracle yes. of a new covenant. A new life is going to be imparted from the Master in heaven. We're going to pray and it's not a yes. prayer that saves us. It's the expression of our heart yes. towards Christ, faith in Him. But let us pray together for all. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I'm sorry for my sins, the things I've done, and the way I've lived. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe He died for my sin and then rose again, and that He's alive. And I believe that my faith in Him can cleanse me can heal me, can save me, can give me a brand new life. So I come to him and express my faith in him as my Lord and as my Savior. And according to the word of God, that cannot lie, I have been washed, I have been cleansed, I have been saved in Jesus' name. Would you give him a hand? Yes.